I am Rishita Chakraborty. I work in the research and development team at a pharmaceutical MNC. I'm currently based in India. So let's start our lesson. Before that, let me tell you the things we are going to cover today. We are going to talk about the basic concept of confounding, the ways we can identify confounders and assess them, dealing with several confounding variables, degree of confounding, and other ways we can view confounding. We'll also cover confounding in factorial experiments and how to control confounding in study design. So let us get started with it. First, the concept of confounding. Often a third factor may have an important influence on the apparent relationship between the risk factor and disease status. If this third factor can explain at least partially this relationship, then we say that confounding is present. Now let us take an example. For example, a relationship between the number of children and prevalent breast cancer for a sample of mother may actually be explained by the ages of the mother. Because older mother tend to have more children and also have a greater chance of having contracted breast cancer. Therefore, age is then a third factor that explains the observed relationship between the number of children and breast cancer. Therefore, in this scenario, the effect upon breast cancer of multiple childbearing is confounded with the effect of age. Let us look at this path diagram for a better understanding of this example. So if we see that there is a relationship between the number of children and breast cancer, we have to also take into account the confounding factor age because a number of children is actually not directly associated with breast cancer. Older people tend to have more number of children and older people also tend to contract breast cancer. Hence age is therefore the confounding variable, number of children the risk factor and breast cancer the disease status. Another way we can define a confounding variable or a confounder, confounder is that a confounding variable or a confounder is an extraneous factor that wholly or partially account for the observed effect of the risk factor on disease status. The effect here could be an apparent relationship or an apparent lack of relationship. Therefore, if there is no relationship present and we, are un we think that a relationship is present, a confounding factor may be the reason to think so. That is, it may show significant risk when in actuality there is no risk or confounder is actually masking a true relationship. Two other examples we can consider here is smoking, alcohol use and lung cancer. If we find that alcohol use has an association with lung cancer, we also have to take in account the confounding factor present here that is smoking. People who have an increased alcohol use tend to be smokers and smoker, smokers are the ones which actually causes lung cancer. Therefore, alcohol use has a false association with lung cancer. Smoking is the real reason lung cancer can occur and it is strongly associated with it. Here, alcohol use can be called the exposure and lung cancer, the outcome. Another example we can consider is rate of ice cream consumption and number of sunburns. When we see that uh, there are people who are consuming more number of ice creams are also people who are having more number of sunburns. So in this scenario, the hidden confounding factor is hot temperature. At the time when temperature is hot, it could be summer, people tend to consume more ice cream and also tend to have more number of sunburns. So the confounder is actually what is Hence, the presence of the confounder is the relationship 
we see an association between weight of ice cream consumption and number of sunburns. Let us consider the first situation where confounding is present. Now table 4.1 shows the cross tabulation of risk factor status exposure and no exposure in these examples and disease outcome of a hypothetical prospective study of 320 subjects. So now we can find the relative risk present here. The formula for this one is uh, we have to take the disease status has to be in disease and the risk factor status has to be exposed. So 81 multiplied by 28 plus 182 will be in the numerator and in the denominator it will be 28 multiplied by 81 and 29. If we put in this formula we will get the relative risk which is 5.52. In this scenario we find that the relative risk exposure versus not is 5.52. This is formally significant that is P is less than 0.0001. The conclusion we gather here is that risk factor does indeed have an effect on disease. However, suppose that we all have data on a third variable, a potential confounding factor denoted by C. Again, suppose we simply record whether C was present or absent in each subject. So here when confounder is absent, we get the relative risk as 1 and when the confounder is present, we get, we also get the relative risk as 1. In the former case, both those exposed and unexposed to the risk factor have a disease status of 0 0.1 and hence the relative risk is 1. In the latter case, the two risks are 0 0.8 and hence the relative risk is also 1. When considered within levels of C, the supposed risk factor has absolutely no effect on the disease. The apparent relationship is entirely then explained by the confounding factor C. So now we can find relative risk with this formula. 80 plus 8 divided by the entire exposed and non-exposed when confounder is present. Then 1 plus 20 divided by entire exposed and non-exposed when confounder is absent. Therefore, we think that we are seeing the effect of the risk factor when actually we may be seeing the effect of C. So now let us consider another situation. Now this table shows results from another hypothetical prospective study. This time before we consider the confounder, the potential risk factor has absolutely no effect. The risk is the same whether it is present or not as we can see here. Table 4.4, the three-way cross classification identifies that on the contrary, exposure to the risk factor is more likely to lead to disease. In fact, 2.45 times more likely. Indeed, we apply a formal hypothesis test to either of the subtables. The relative risk is significantly different from unity. P is 0 0.03 and we can see it is less than 0 0.0001. Just like we can see. So in this example, the presence of confounder tends to go with the absence of risk factor while the absence of confounder tends to go with the presence of risk factor. So the complete opposite things are happening here. The presence of risk factor, we are seeing So the complete opposite things are happening here. The presence of confounder so here we can see completely different things happening. Presence of confounder goes with an absence of risk factor and absence of confounder goes with the presence of risk factor. Therefore, in table 4.3, the exposure to the risk factor and C are effectively cancelling each other out.
So these are the two examples of confounding. Now there are some other points that we need to know about confounding. When perfect confounding, that is the relative risk or other estimates of relative chance of disease for the various levels, which can be more than two of the confounder are same, this common value is different from the relative risk when the confounding variable is ignored. Second point is that generally confounding is more likely to lead to underestimation or overestimation of an effect unless we control for it. The third point to keep in mind is that perfect confounding is an extremely unlikely scenario in real life epidemiological data. Furthermore, approximations to perfect confounding are neither necessary nor sufficient for confounding to be present. The degree of confounding may be much more marginal or less consistent across the subtables. The last point to keep in mind is that confounding is not an important issue whenever the estimates in the different level or strata of the confounder are very similar and are also not very different from the overall estimate. Now, how will we identify confounders? To identify confounders, certain conditions are necessary. If C is to be a confounder, it must follow two criteria. Number one, be related to the disease but not be a consequence of the disease. And number two, be related to the risk factor but not be a consequence of the risk factor. So now let us denote the disease by D, the risk factor by F and the third variable by C. These are the path diagrams which shows when C is not a confounder. This figure illustrates four possible situations in which C is not a confounder. To see why it is not a confounder, it is useful to consider the consequence of controlling the relationship between the risk factor and the disease status, especially for C. So, situation A. This is the most straightforward one when F and C are acting independently. So we see that they are not related at all. It would be incorrect to control for C here because it will serve us no purpose. The example given here is smoking and high cholesterol diet. So smoking causes CHD and high cholesterol diet also causes CHD. But high cholesterol diet cannot be a confounding factor because it has no effect on smoking. Therefore, this is definitely not a confounder. Situation B. Here, C causes D but only through the intermediate agent that is F. Diet of no fruit leads to diet low in vitamin C which can lead to scurvy but no fruit has no direct association with having scurvy because without food a person can have other sources of vitamin C which will prevent them from having scurvy. So here the C only has an effect on, on D through its relationship with the risk factor. Therefore, C cannot be called a confounder in this scenario too. Now let us consider situation C. Here smoking and fibrinogen are both risk factors for CHD, but smoking promotes increased fibrinogen. Controlling smoking for fibrinogen would not be sensible because this would effectively mean controlling the effect of smoking for part of itself. Hence, fibrinogen is not a confounder. The last scenario. In this is an added feature where D, that is the disease status, also causes C. 
People who have myocardial infarction are routinely advised to take aspirins to help avoid a recurrence. Controlling any risk factor such as heavy drinking associated causally or non-causally with aspirin taking would not be sensible because this is effectively controlling the effect of disease on a consequence of the disease itself. Therefore, aspirin cannot be called a confounder either. Now let us talk about the strategy for selecting confounders. What makes something a confounder depends upon data-based observed relationship and a priori knowledge of the supposed biological processes at work. This figure summarizes the necessary conditions to decide which variables are potential confounders. Double-sided arrows are used to denote non-causal relationships like you can see here and here, while single-sided arrows show the direction of causality, like in this one, this one, this one, this one. Therefore, to be considered a confounder, here D is the disease status, F is the risk factor, and C is the confounder. So, either C should cause D, or it should have a non-causal relationship, and C should cause F or have a non-causal relationship with F but however C should not be a consequence of D or should not be a consequence of F in any matter. Assessing confounding. There are two ways we can assess confounding using estimation and using hypothesis tests. For estimation we can assess confounding by estimating the effect of risk factor with or without allowing for confounding. We'll talk about an example after a little while. And uh, so let us talk about an example right now. In example 4.3, which is this example, here we can see that the relative risk of renting is 1.43 unadjusted and around 1.30 the average over two strata after adjusting for smoking. So this is the relative risk of renting which is 1.43 unadjusted and around 1.30 after adjusting of smoking. So 1.30, if we take an average over this, so 1.27 and 1.33, we get 1.30. So we would then estimate the effect of confounding as EC by E, where E is the unadjusted and EC is the adjusted estimate. So in this example, it will be 1.30, which is the average, by 1.43, the unadjusted one, which leads up to 0 0.91. Therefore, adjustment has reduced the relative risk by 9%. Method of adjusting for confounding will be covered in the stratification presentation, which I will take after this one. So one problem with this approach is that the answer will depend upon the measure of comparative chance of disease, which is exposed versus non-exposed that is used. Without the comparison, we cannot make it work. However, when the risk factor has more than two levels, there is no single measure for confounding EC by E because this will vary by the levels being compared. He, here, since we are only being able to compare in two levels, more than one level, uh, sorry, I mean, since here we are comparing only two levels, uh, where risk factor has more than two levels, there will not be a single measure for confounding. Henceforth, whenever the disease is rare, the assessment of confounder by odds ratio by relative risk will be very similar. So the now, let us talk about the process where we can use hypothesis tests. No direct tests is there for successful confounding. However, we can do test is whether the relative risk and disease status are related after the adjustment of confounding has been made. This is how we can test this.
we can test for an adjusted relationship between relative risk and disease status, which is often interpreted as the adjusted effect of, uh, which is often interpreted as the adjusted effect of relative, of risk factor on disease status. We might compare the result to a similar test before adjustment has been made. For example, if say risk factor is highly significant or related to the disease status before adjustment, that is P is less than 0 0.001, but not after adjustment. After adjustment, P is greater than 0 0.1. Then the evidence is that the confounder has really had an effect. Conversely, when there is still a significant effect to risk factor on disease status after adjustment for confounding has been made, we may infer that risk factor has an effect on disease status over and above any effect it has on the confounder. Such a significant adjusted effect is often called an independent effect by epidemiologists, especially when effect of risk factor has been adjusted for all other known risk factors for disease status simultaneously. So how can we deal with several confounding variables? Now, table 4.5 over here shows data from six years follow-up of men in the Scottish Heart Health Study, SHHS in short. These data are for those with no symptoms of coronary heart disease, that is CHD. At the beginning of the study, the variable housing tenure, this one, records whether they rent or own their accommodation. As can be seen, the chance of a CHD event is substantially higher amongst the renters. Here. So when the study began, housing rental in Scotland was predominantly a feature of the more disadvantaged social groups. The more disadvantaged tend to have less healthy lifestyle, and hence the question arises as to whether the risk of renting is explained by confounding with lifestyle. In particular, 57% of renters, but only 35% of the owner-occupied smoked cigarettes, and cigarette smoking is a well-established risk factor of CHD. So this table point 4.6, the next one, shows table point 4.5 split by cigarette smoking status. For, this is for the non-smokers, and this one is for the smokers. As before, living in rented housing seems to be a risk factor. However, its effect has been reduced because of the smaller relative risks, like we can see. Once we account for smoking, the relative risk has been reduced. Certainly, confounding is present here because a similar reduction has occurred in each stratum. Since the reductions are minor, we can conclude that the degree of confounding is small. So, till now, for our simplicity, this exam the foregoing examples have taken the situation in which only one confounding variable is present. In practice, there could be several. The analytical methods for dealing with one confounder may easily be extended to the case of several confounders. For example, stratification, which will... Uh, which can be used uh, to exam all the three examples that we have mentioned till now. So, ju we just talked about this example right now. So, if we consider smoking as yes or no, an exercise coded as seldom, sometimes, often, very often, as confounders for the relationship between housing tenor and CHD, we would define 2 into 4 equal to 8 strata and corresponding subtables. So, this is how we can deal with several confounding variables if they are applied in this example as per exercise. The interpretation of the effect of several confounders is much less straightforward.
The effect of any one confounder may be quite different when a second confounder is also considered. In general, we cannot necessarily predict what the joint or adjusted effects of two confounders will be simply from observing their relationship to each other and their individual relationships to the disease. It is how they affect the relationship between risk factor and disease that is crucial. So another way we can view confounding. Let us look at this example. Suppose we have a model where y acts as the outcome, x is a dichotomous variable of main interest, and c is a potential confounder. If we ignore the confounder, then we would run this model as y equal to alpha plus beta 1 x. From this model, the effect of a one unit change in x is simply beta 1. However, if we add the potential confounder to the model, the model then becomes y equal to alpha star plus beta star 1 x plus beta 2 c, where it can be shown that beta star 1 is actually beta 1 minus beta 2 and in the brackets where cx equal to 1 minus cx equal to 0. So there are several possibilities. Let us look at them to understand this model a little better. So if c, that is the confounder, is not related to x, then cx will be 1 minus cx equal to 0 which will tend to be 0 and beta star 1 will actually be beta 1. So number 2 is if c is not related to y, then the value of beta 2 over here will be 0 and beta star 1 will then tend to be equal to beta 1 because this term will be 0. So in both of the above cases, there is in fact no confounding. So not surprisingly, beta 1 stays the same regardless as to whether C is in the model or not. Because if C is changing or beta 2 is changing, this term is the one which is becoming 0, whereas beta 1 is remaining the same. And the third point if C is in fact related to both X and Y, we have confounding and beta 1 is a biased estimate of the true effect of X on Y owing to the confounding from C. Thus, we include C in the model used beta star 1 as the estimate of the effect of X on Y. The magnitude of the bias depends both on strength of the relationship between C and Y as measured by beta 2 and also on the strength of the relationship between X and Y as measured by Cx equal to 1 minus Cx equal to 0. So this is another way we can view confounding. So confounding is present in factorial experiments too. This concept is a big concept so I'm only going to talk about the basic right now. The process by which unimportant treatment combinations are entangled or mixed up with incomplete block differences for the purpose of assessing more important treatment combinations with greater precision is called confounding. It is the deliberate introduction of non-orthogonality in a design in order to get better estimates of more important treatment contrasts but this is actually not considered a defect of the design. So what is non-orthogonality which is introduced in a design? Orthogonality actually refers to the property of a design that ensures that all specified parameters may be estimated independent of any other. So usually factorial designs are orthogonal and balanced but confounding introduces this non-orthogonality so some factors become dependent on the others the effect of factors which are mixed up with block effects are said to be confounded with block effects and cannot be estimated separately
the technique of confounding consists of splitting up each replicate or the whole block into a number of smaller replicates or incomplete blocks and allocating the treatment combinations to these blocks in a way that ensures orthogonality of the treatment contrast due to the block effects with the unconfounded effects, but also imposing non-orthogonality of the same to those effects which are to be confounded. If it's still a little bit confusing for you to understand, just remember that one, when you see a model of a factorial experiment and there's an equation, all the parameters of the independent variables have to be independent of each other. But due to confounding, one becomes dependent of the other. Just like we saw in the path diagrams, a hidden factor is introduced. So this is the problem we have when we are talk, dealing with block effects in conf uh, block effects in factorial designs. Confounding may be carried out in two ways. It can be complete or total confounding or partial confounding. If an effect is of little or no interest, it may be confounded with the incomplete block differences in every replicate of the design. This is called complete confounding, whereby the information on that particular effect is lost from every replicate and hence completely from the entire design. On the other hand, if some effects are confounded in one or more replicates but definitely not all, it is called partial confounding. It is confounded only partially, whereby information on the confounding effects is lost to some of the replicates. They are, confounding, they are confounded with incomplete block differences in some replicates and unconfounded in others. Their information is only partially available from the design and hence the name partial confounding, where confounding doesn't happen to all the replicates. So there are three ways that we can potentially control confounding in a study design. First one is restriction. One of the conditions necessary for confounding to occur is that the confounding factor must be distributed unequally among the groups being compared. Consequently, one of the strategies employed for avoiding confounding is to restrict admission into the study into a group of subjects who have the same levels of the confounding factors. So if we restrict admission into study, then confounding can be controlled to some extent. For example, in the hypothetical study, looking at the association between physical activity and heart disease, suppose that age and gender were the only two confounders of concern. If that is the case, then confounding by these factors could have been totally avoided by making sure that all subjects were males between the age of 40 to 50. This will ensure that the age distributions are similar in the group being compared so that confounding will be minimized. So we can see we are res restricting the female groups and people of different ages to control for confounding here. So this approach to controlling confounding is simple and effective, but it has several limitations. So let us go through them. The first one is it reduces the number of subjects who are eligible, may cause sample size problem because yes, females can be eligible or people of different ages can be eligible, which it reduces the sample size. Number two. Residual confounding can occur if you don't restrict narrowly enough. For example, in the study on exercise and heart disease, the investigators might have restricted the study to men aged 40 to 65. However, the age-related risk of heart disease still varies widely within the range as do levels of physical activity. You can't evaluate the effects of factors that have been restricted for. For example, if the study is limited to men aged 45 to 50, you can't use the study to examine the effect of gender or age because these factors don't vary within your sample. And the last one is 
the restriction limits generalizability. For example, if you restrict the study to men, you may not be able to generalize the findings to women. So these are the limitations of restriction. So the second way that we can control for confounding is randomization in clinical trials. In studies investigating the effects of therapy or other interventions, it is often possible to reduce confounding by randomization. The randomization procedure randomly assigns patients to an experimental group or to a control group. Randomization helps to prevent selection bias by a clinician, sometimes also referred to as confounding by indication. Although randomization of large groups of patients will frequently result in a similar distribution of known and unknown confounders in the experimental and the control group, it is unlikely that this balance will be achieved for all patient characteristics. Although the balance may be incomplete, the randomization process does not guarantee that any differences between the two groups are due to the chance and not due to the choice of the physician. Thus, although differences in potential confounders between the two groups may still exist after randomization, they are likely to be reduced as much as possible. So the third way that we can control for confounding is matching. Instead of restriction, one could also ensure that the study groups do not differ with respect to possible confounders such as an age, gender by matching the two comparison groups. For example, for every active male between the ages of 40 to 50, we could find and enroll an inactive male between the ages of 40 to 50. In this way, the groups we are comparing can artificially be made similar with respect to these factors so they cannot confound the relationship. This method actually requires the investigators to control confounding in both the design and analysis phases of the study because the analysis of matched study groups differs from that of unmatched studies. Like restriction, this approach is straightforward and it can be effective. However, it also has the following disadvantages. So let us go through them too. First, it can be time consuming and expensive. Second, it limits sample size. Third, you can't evaluate the effects of the factors you have to match for. Nevertheless, matching is useful in the following circumstances. If one needs to control for complex multifaceted variables, for example, heredity or environmental factors, then matching is very important. Or while doing a case control study in which there are many possible controls, but a smaller number of cases, example, 4 is to 1 matching in the study examining the association between DES and vaginal cancer. In this scenario, matching can also be quite effective. So before we end our presentation today, let us note that all these methods mentioned are applicable at the time of study design before the process of data gathering. When experimental designs are premature, impractical, or impossible, researchers must rely on statistical methods to adjust for potential confounding effects. Unlike selection or information bias, confounding is one type of bias that can be adjusted after data gathering using statistical models. To control for confounding in the analysis, investigators should measure the confounders in the study. Researchers usually do this by collecting data on all known, previously identified confounders. There are mostly two options to deal with confounders in the analysis change, stratification and multivariate methods. These methods will be covered in detail in the following lecture. So these are the following references for my presentation and I recommend this book which is Epidemiology, Study, Design and Data Analysis by Chapman and Hall. If you go through it, then you, the concepts will be clear. The examples are explained a little more lucidly in the book. I highly recommend it. And thank you for listening to this presentation. I hope you enjoyed it and had a great time. See you in my next presentation about stratification. Welcome back, everyone.
This is Rishita Chakraborty from India and I work at a pharmaceutical MNC. So you all have probably listened to my first lecture on confounding. So let us move on to the first half of the second lecture, which is on stratification. I hope you all enjoy this one too. So the contents for this one is statistical analysis to eliminate confounding effects. We learn about Simpson's paradox, Mantel-Hensel methods, its assumptions, and Mantel-Hensel relative risk. We'll also cover Cochrane Mantel-Hensel methods test and look at scenarios with more than two substrata. So let's start. Statistical analysis to eliminate confounding effects. First, one is stratification. This lecture will be based on this method only. The objective of stratification is to fix the level of the confounders and produce groups within which the confounder does not vary. Then we evaluate the exposure outcome association within each stratum of the confounder. So within each stratum, the confounder cannot confound because it does not vary across the exposure outcome. After stratification, mantel hensel estimator can be employed to provide an adjusted result according to strata. If there is difference between crude result and adjusted result produced from strata, confounding is likely. But in the case that crude result does not differ from the adjusted result, then confounding is unlikely. The second one is standardization. Standardization, standardization provides another tool that can cope with confounding, although hampered by some of the same constraints as in stratification. Typically, disease or death rates are only standardized to age and perhaps to sex and race, even in large registry-based studies. If more factors are considered, then separate analysis must be undertaken for specific subgroups. While stratification of confounders relies on information at the individual level in the study population, standardization actually involves the use of a reference population obtained either from the data set or from an external source such as data from a larger geographical scale. There are two main approaches that handle confounding by standardization, direct and indirect standardization, resulting in adjusted rates and standardized ratio. We won't be covering standardization today, but if you're interested to dive into the details of standardization, I'll recommend you a book after the lecture, which you can go through. Now, in case of multivariate models, let us look into logistic regression first. The special thing about logistic regression is that it can control for numerous confounders if there is a large enough sample size. Thus, logistic regression is a mathematical model that can give an odds ratio which is controlled for multiple confounders. This odds ratio is known as the adjusted odds ratio because its values has been adjusted for the other covariates including confounders. Linear regression. This model can be employed as a multiple linear regression to see through confounding and isolate the relationship of interest. In multiple linear regression, investigators can include many covariates at one time. The process of accounting for covariates is also called adjustments and comparing the results of simple and multiple linear regressions can clarify that how much the confounders in the model distort the relationship between exposure and outcome. Now, analysis of covariance or ANCOVA. ANCOVA is used to control for potential confounding variables. ANCOVA tests whether certain factors have an effect on the outcome variable after removing the variance for which quantitative covariates or confounders account. The inclusion of this analysis can increase the statistical power. Before we start with mantel hensel procedures, let us know what Simpson's paradox is. The idea behind Simpson's paradox is relatively simple. The investigator disaggregates the data into homogeneous subgroups or strata to see if the association seen in the undivided aggregate data holds true during subsequent analysis. Not surprisingly, data can apparently show one thing when they are in aggregate form and show something quite different when they are disaggregated. This phenomenon is known as Simpson's paradox. This is where the concept of stratification 
comes in because the aggregated data shows different results than the disaggregated one. Now, before moving for further, let me tell you that the measures of, measures of association in the aggregate are called crude measures of association since relationships have yet to be separated out or otherwise adjusted. Now, numerical illustrations will serve to demonstrate Simpson's paradox. Assume data come from a cohort study in which the exposed group shows an incidence of 200 by 1000 which is 20% and the unexposed group shows an incidence of 50 by 1000 which is 5%. Then the crude or unstratified relative risk is therefore 20% by 5% the first incidence by the second incidence which is 4.0. However, a crude relative risk may hide different patterns of risk once disaggregated. So let us look at three scenarios. This is the first scenario. This shows a situation in which neither confounding nor interaction are present. Notice that the strata specific relative risks and crude risks equal 4. RR1 is 4, RR2 is 4 and the crude relative risk is also 4. The need for stratification here is therefore superfluous or absolutely unnecessary. Now let us look at the second scenario which is the in this scenario the, it shows a situation where the same crude data disaggregates to reveal strata specific relative risk of one so this same crude data we get relative risk of one and relative risk of one which is stratum specific nevertheless a single relative risk summarizes the relationship between the exposure and the disease in this case, it would be safe to say that relative risk is 1. So, I'm going to repeat again that here D means disease is present, disease is absent, and E means exposure is present, and E minus means non-exposure. And the final scenario is this one. Here we can see that RR1 is 1.0, whereas RR2 is 23.5. In this scenario, the nature of the association depends on the influence of extraneous factor C and interaction between E and C can be said to exist. So there is an interaction between the exposure and the confounder. In such instances, summary measures of association should be in favor of strata specific findings. Data in these scenarios illustrate how stratification might reveal otherwise hidden confounding and interaction. In fact, when we look at it this way, Simpson's paradox is not really a paradox at all, but it is the logical consequence of failing to recognize the effects of an extraneous factor. So let us start with mantel hensel methods. But before that, I want to ask you a question. What do you think is the purpose of the mantel hensel procedure? Well, the answer is that the mantel hensel procedure provides a summary measure of association by adjusting for confounders when interaction is absent. The mantel hensel estimate is a weighted average of the odds ratio in the individual strata. The weight for any one stratum is chosen to be equal to the precision measured as the inverse of the estimated variance of the odds ratio for the stratum. In this way, the most precise stratum specific odds ratio gets the largest weight. Generally, this will tend to give greater weight to the bigger strata, that is the strata with larger ni. So, please pause this video and note down this table because we will use these denotions from now on. There is disease, no disease, exposed, non-exposed and totals. AI, BI, EI, CI, DI, EI cap, DI, DI cap and NI, E and D are capital. Now the mantel hensel test statistic is given by summation of AI into DI divided by NI whole divided by summation BI into CI divided by NI. 
in order to derive a confidence interval for this estimate we need to consider a standard error instead we will consider the standard error of the natural logarithm of the test statistics this one because this quantity has a more symmetrical distribution that is much better approximated by a normal distribution just as for the odds ratio in a single stratum so for the standard error please look at this formulas where pi is ai plus di by ni qi is bi plus ci by ni ri is ai into di by ni and si is bi into ci by ni and we we'll substitute these values in this formula to find the standard error as standard error for this test statistic and for the 95% confidence interval limits for the logarithm of the test statistics the values are given as follows we will use these formulas in numericals further so what are the mantel hensel methods assumptions the mh approach is based upon an assumption that the parameter representing the comparative chance of disease does not vary by levels of the confounding variables mh summary measures of relative risk is only appropriate when there is a constant relative risk across the strata and a test of null hypothesis of no interaction is also a test of the suitability of application of mantel hensel technique to calculate the mantel hensel relative risk we will use this test statistic and then we'll estimate the standard error of the logarithm using this formula so please note down all these formulas and here capital e i cap and capital e i is this one the total values for the exposed and non exposed i hope you have seen the formula now so now we are going to apply all these formulae in this example here the data involves two strata for the confounder smoking status for smokers and non smokers and the data presented i have totals included so this is non smokers with chd no chd and total smokers with chd no chd and total and housing tenure for rented and owner occupied so using this formula for the mantel hensel test statistics apply it here and then check the answer with my pause this video and do the sum for yourself so it is again ai just look at here ai into di by cap ni whole divided by bi into ci by ni so ai into di by ni whole uh, plus also for smokers ai into di by ni and then we do this one bi into ci by ni plus bi into ci by ni so this is how we get the test statistics and using the formula for p1 q1 r1 s1 for non smokers and then for smokers we get these values again let me show you the formula we are using here this one is for the pi qi ri and si do it yourself and check it so this is how we proceed we calculate the summations first and then finally we calculate the standard error of the logarithm of the stat statistics and the confidence interval for the mantel hensel estimate given here which is 0.95 comma 1.82 the smoking adjusted estimate of the odds ratio for chd comparing renters to owner occupiers is 1.32 which is the test statistics with 95% confidence interval of 0.95 comma 
now to estimate the common relative risk the mantel hensel we use this formula for the mantel estimate this one is the relative risk formula where capital ei bar is the exposed capital ei bar is the non exposed total and capital ei is the exposed totals So using this formula again, try to do it yourself and then match your calculations with mine. We get the estimate and then we find standard error of the logarithm of the test statistics. Uh, for simplicity in calculation, we have denoted the numerator by T and the denominator by B. So finally, we get the standard error as 0 0.1587 and the confidence interval as shown here which is 0 0.95 and 1.78 therefore the smoking adjusted estimate of the relative risk of chd for renters compared with owner occupiers is 1.30 with 95 percent confidence interval 0 0.95 comma 1.78 Now, the Cochrane Mantel Hensel methods test. So, whether odds ratio or relative risk are used to estimate relative propensity for disease, the association between the risk factor and the disease controlling for the founder can be tested using a test attributed to Cochrane as well as Mantel and Hensel. The test of no association can be based upon a test of the expected cell values say small ai this expected value is a value from a hypergeometric distribution with expected that is mean value eai and variance vai where eai is given as di ei by ni and vai is given as di di bar ei ei bar whole divided by ni square and in the bracket ni minus one so again refer this table to see what are di di bar ei ei bar, bar and ni if the distribution from which ai is derived is not very skewed we expect expect the distribution of as shown here to be approximately chi square on one degree of freedom so for this example this one use this formula and calculate ai e ai va uh, so for this example, as shown here, use this formula and calculate A1, A2, EA1, EA2, VA1 and VA2. Do it yourself and then try to match your answers. Pause this video and do it. All right. I hope you have done this. So using the given equation as shown here, the continuity corrected test statistics is given as the answer we get is 2.54. So in comparing using chi square table on one degree of freedom, this is not significant even at the 10% level. Hence, we conclude that there is no evidence of an association between housing tenure and CHD after allowing for cigarette smoking status. There is no evidence to refute the hypothesis that the adjusted odds ratio equals 1 or that the adjusted relative risk is 1. In the examples above, we use just two levels or substrata for the confounding variable. But one can use more than two substrata. This is particularly important when using stratification to control for confounding by a continuously distributed variable like age. In an example where we look at, say, the relationship between obesity and cardiovascular disease, we stratify the data by age looking at the relationship in subjects less than 50 and those who were 50 plus. However, subjects less than 50 are likely to vary substantially with respect to BMI and rates of cardiovascular disease. The same is also true for subjects of age 50 plus. Therefore, by stratifying into just two broad age groups, we would likely have a problem with residual confounding. To deal with this, we could stratify by age at five years interval. 
So here we can see the crude analysis, which is CVD and obesity, and we stratify it into five years age groups. However, there are certain limitations of stratified analysis. A stratified analysis is easy to do and gives you a fairly good picture of what's going on. However, a major disadvantage to stratification is its inability to control simultaneously for multiple compounding variables. For example, you might decide to control for gender, three levels of smoking exposure, four levels of age, and four levels of BMI. This would require 96 separate strata to control for all these variables simultaneously. And as you increase the number of strata, you keep whittling away at the number of people in each stratum. So sample size becomes a major problem since many of the strata will contain few or no people. Here we can see that if we are stratifying by gender, age, five categories, smoking status, never, former, current, three categories, then there are three levels of smoking for each age and gender group, there are 30 different substrata, which can be a little difficult to handle. So this was the first half of my second lecture on stratification. I hope you enjoyed this one too. So for references, again, I would suggest Woodwork Marks, Epidemiology, Study Design and Data Analysis. You can look at standardization in details in this book too. Thank you, everyone. And the next part of the lecture will be on interaction. Welcome back, everyone. So this is Rishita Chakraborty again from India, and I work at a pharmaceutical MNC. So let us proceed with my final lecture on interaction. I hope you enjoyed this one too. So the topics we are going to cover today are the concept of interaction, testing for interaction, interaction effects between continuous variables, and interpretation of interaction from factorial experiments. So what is the concept of interaction? If instead the third factor modifies the relationship between risk factor and the disease, then interaction is said to be present. Interaction occurs between two risk factors when the effect of one risk factor upon disease is different at different levels of the second risk factor. Hence the equivalent term effect modification when no interaction occurs, the effect of each of the risk factors are consistent, homogeneous across the level of other risk factors. So, in however, interaction and effect modification is not the same thing. Interaction and effect modification are formally defined within the counterfactual framework. Interaction is defined in terms of the effects of two interventions, whereas effect modification is defined in terms of the effect of one intervention varying over strata of a second variable. To understand this further, an example of interaction occurs in the cohort study of elderly people in which the chance of death or institutionalization within two years was much greater for those who had previously suffered a hip fracture at the start of these two years, but the excess risk associated with a hip fracture was significantly higher for men than women. This is an interaction between hip fracture status, which is yes and no, and sex. So we can see that like in case of confounder where there is a hidden factor present between the risk factor and disease status, in interaction, this actually modifies the relationship. For simplicity, let us assume for now that both of the risk factors have only two outcomes. Call these exposure and non-exposure. Then interaction occurs when the comparative effect of exposure compared with non-exposure for one risk factor is different for the subgroup who are and the subgroup who are not exposed to the second risk factor. If things are still a little unclear, let me explain this concept with some fun pictures. So this is an example of interaction. Let's say, a new estrogen receptor agonist is being evaluated for the treatment of postmenopausal symptoms. A prospective study shows that the drug increases the risk of deep vein thrombosis, DVT, in treated women who smoke compared to untreated women who smoke with a relative risk of 1.70 and p-value of 
in non smokers no increased risk of dvt is evident with the use of the drug here the relative risk is 0.96 and p value is 0.68 so here we can see that more dvt cases are in treated women who smoke than untreated women who do not smoke so at first if we think that smoking could be a confounder and match by smoking status we will find that within the smokers those who takes the pill gets more dvt therefore true association does indeed exist between pills and that leads to people who have dvt with non smokers there is no increased risk of dvt so here we can see that especially females not taking the pill and taking the pill uh, they are having dvt relative risk is 1.7 p value 0.01 which is less than 0.05 hence it is very significant whereas in this case when the person is not smoking it doesn't matter whether they are taking the pill or they are not taking the pill because p value is 0.68 which is not significant at all hence forth we can conclude that results depend on the third variable and smoking is actually an effect modifier which modifies this true association here interaction is present another example we can say here is that whether aspirin causes rye syndrome if someone asks is that true does aspirin causes rye syndrome the answer is yes if it's a child and no if it's an adult so hence here age is actually the effect modifier depending on the age of the person we can conclude whether they will have rye syndrome or they will not have rye syndrome therefore this is also a case of interaction so this figure gives a set of interaction diagrams that illustrate three ways in which interaction could happen as well as the situation of no interaction so this number d is antagonism antagonism is when the effect of risk factor a works in the opposite direction when acting in presence of exposure to the direction in which it acts in the absence of exposure to risk factor b this is actually the strongest type of interaction because it represents a reversal of effect a quality difference this number c is synergism synergism is when the effect of a is in the same direction but stronger in the presence of b here we can see the effect of a is in the same direction but stronger in the presence of b whereas in this case it is in the opposite directions now number b is unilateralism unilateralism is when a has no effect in the absence of b but a considerable effect when b is present and exposed to b a has no effect but when it is exposed to b it has a considerable effect in fact presence and absence of exposure are interchangeable in these definitions this figure illustrates that the situation in which a and b themselves interchangeable or risk factors rather than protective factors for the disease unilateralism could alternatively appear as a sideways v that is with both lines emanating from the same point to see this we can consider the diagram which is the b1 uh, how it would look rather than a if a were plotted in a horizontal axis and the first one the first diagram shows a lack of interaction it means it does not mean that the chance of disease how they measured after exposure to a is the same regardless of the exposure status to b it does not mean that when the chance of disease is measured by risk this would be the situation of statistical independence hence it would appear as a single line like we can see here rather than the parallel lines for no interaction lack of interaction means that the comparative chance comparative chance is constant now there are three ways that we can test for interaction using the relative risk 
using odds ratio and using risk difference. So the first one is using the relative risk or RR. Suppose there are two risk factors A and B that are studied at two levels 0 and 1. When relative risk is used to measure relative chance of disease, we shall say no interaction occurs when R11 by R01 equal to R10 by R00. Say this is equation A. That is, there is no interaction if the relative risk for exposure, that is, no exposure to A is the same in both strata of B. Now, if we multiply both sides of equation A by R01 by R10, shows that A and B are interchangeable. Now, because the mantel hensel summary measure of relative risk is only appropriate when there is a constant relative risk across the strata, a test of null hypothesis of no interaction is also a test of the suitability of application of the mantel hensel technique, assuming, of course, other requirements for confounding are met. Thus, whenever we seek to apply the mantel hensel procedure, we should first apply a test of interaction. A test for interaction. A test for a common relative risk given by this across all strata is given by comparing summation of AI minus expectation of AI whole square divided by variance of AI to chi square on L minus 1 degrees of freedom. So here we can see the expectation and the variances for AI, BI, CI and DI. Note down all of these equations. Now, to be able to evaluate 1 and 2, this one and this one, we need to fix the value for lambda naught. One way to do this, which works reasonably well in practice, is to use the mantel hensel estimate. This one. Returning to the simple situation in which each risk factor has two levels, another way of looking at the definition of no interaction with relative risk comes from multiplying both sides of equation A, which gives R11 by R00 equal to R10 by R00 into R01 by R00. Let us say this is equation B. Henceforth, if we think of four groups defined by joint exposure, non-exposure to A and B, where three relative risks can be defined relative to the base level, no exposure to A or B, lambda AB for the group that is exposure to both, lambda A B bar for group that is exposed to A alone, and lambda B A bar for group that is exposed to B alone. Thus, equation B becomes lambda AB equal to lambda AB bar into lambda B A bar. Here it is only exposure to A, whereas here it is only exposure to B. Now this equation is a multiplicative re relationship. For this reason, the model for interaction assumed here is called multiplicative model. On taking logarithm of both sides of equation A, we get log R11 minus log R01 equal to log 1 R10 minus log R00. So the next method is using the odds ratio. When the odds ratio is used in place of the relative risk, theoretical details follow in very much the same way as in previous discussions of RR. As with RR or relative risk, no interaction means that there is a constant OR or odds ratio for exposure compared with no exposure to A across the strata of B or vice versa, giving a multiplicative model of interaction. Now using the same equation we did, that is equation one, this one, a test for a constant odds ratio across the strata is evaluated to observe the effect of interaction. Since OR is used in place of RR, the expected cell frequency, that is expectation of AI is replaced by this formula. I know it doesn't look that great, but it is what it is, you know. And the final method that we can use is risk difference. When the risk difference is used to measure excess risk, no interaction means a constant risk difference for exposure compared with no exposure. 
to A across all strata of B. That is R11 minus R01 equal to R00 when A and B have only two levels. So now, if this be the risk difference for the group that is exposed to A and B, and this can be exposed to A only, and just like A bar B can be uh, exposure to B alone, all compared with the base group that is unexposed to AB, and if we add this term, that is R01 minus R0 to both sides of the equation, we finally get this equation, as you can see. Kind of the same technique as shown for relative risk. And this model of interaction assumed here is called an additive model. So here you can see how we can form a multiplicative model and an additive model in this scenario. One advantage of this additive formulation is that risk can be plotted on the interaction diagram, allowing a more direct interpretation than for RR or OR. When there are two levels for both the risk factors, an approximate test using a normal approximation for an interaction using risk difference is to compare. So this is the term with chi square on one degrees of freedom. Here we can see the variance where nij is the sample size denominator and for rij i and j values will be 0 and 1. So let us follow this example. This table right here shows cigarette smoking status at the start of the SHHS against whether or not CHD event, non-fatal MI or coronary death occurred in the following six years separately for those who had and had not already suffered from myocardial infarction when the study began. On this occasion, SHHS data are shown for women only. Also, women with unknown smoking or previous MI status have been excluded. We can see here, this is for no previous MI, for previous MI, presence of CHD, no CHD, and smoking status is smoker and non-smoker. Here we can see the logarithm of risk of CHD by smoking status and previous MI status for HHS woman, right here. So from this table, we can find out that interaction is clearly suggested because smokers have a higher risk among those without a previous MI and a lower risk amongst those with a previous MI. This suggests that antagonism may occur. So here from this diagram also, we can see that antagonism is occurring. The relative risks are for no previous MI, it will be 3.15 divided by 1.31, which is 2.40. And for previous MI, it will be 13.56 by 21.15, which is 0 0.64. Now, considering this table, we can also do it with mental Hensel relative risk, but I have done it with mental Hensel test statistics over here. The formula you will get in my previous lecture, which was about stratification. From there, you can follow the mental health of test statistics. If you input the values here, you will get it as 2.013. So good thing for all of you to do will be to pause this video and use the notes from the previous lecture of stratification and try to find out the mental health of test statistics and confidence interval. Pause right now. All right, so I hope you have done that already. So then for straight term 1, which is no previous MI, we get this estimate, which is used for the common over all strata. And then this estimate becomes for P1, 7898.133. Again, we can calculate E of A1 from the uh, equation over here. This equation using the odds ratio, we are calculating uh, first P1 and then E of A1. Just look at these numbers and match from the table and understand which one is the psi, which one is the psi naught, psi naught minus one, which is the exposure disease which one is the P1, 
take all these factors into consideration and you will understand this topic more clearly. So here finally we get the variance and uh, the test statistics using the first equation which is the first one we get 7.33. So when compared on chi-square on L minus 1 equal 1 degrees of freedom, we find that P is less, is greater than 0 0.005. So there is strong evidence to reject the null hypothesis. We conclude that interaction measured through odds ratio occurs between smoking and previous MI status in the six-year prediction of coronary effects in SHHS. So now, interaction effects between continuous variables. So, for example, suppose that intentions and actual behavior are both measured as continuous variables this time. Suppose further, it is believed that the effect of intentions on behavior, that is the correspondence between what one wants to do and what one actually does is greater at higher levels of income. That is, the higher one's income is, the more consistently one behaves. The model would then be written as follows. We can see the constant term and all the independent variables, B1, B2, B3, with intentions and incomes model. A positive value for the effect of the interaction term would imply that the higher the income, the greater, that is more positive, the effect of intentions on behavior was. Similarly, the higher the intentions, the greater or more positive the effect of income on behavior. So as income increases, the effect of intentions on behavior also increases. And as intentions increases, the effect of income on behavior also increases. Another example we can see is that the greater the resources available, the stronger the effect of intentions on behavior. Those who are most able to get what they want are most likely to get it. This is another way we can put it. Now, for example, suppose a model includes class force education, income, income into education where income and education have both been centered around their means hence the overall model can be given as this and we can find similar interpretations as shown previously now our final topic interpretation of interaction from factorial experiments so when two or more independent variables are involved in a research design, there is more to consider than simply the mean effect of each of the independent variables, which is also called factors. That is, the effect of one independent variable on the dependent variable of interest may not be the same at all levels of the other independent variable. Another way to put this is that the effect of one independent variable may depend on the level of the other independent variable. In order to find an interaction, there must be a factorial design in which two or more independent variables are crossed with one another so that there are observations at every combination of levels of the two independent variables. Now let us consider this example. To find the effects of practice and stress level on memory task performance, a factorial design can be employed. Practice can be manipulated by having participants read a list of words either once or five times. Stress level can be manipulated by having two conditions. In one, low stress, participants are told that the number of words that they recall is unimportant. And in the other, and in the other, which is high stress, Participants are told that most people can recall all words in the list and that they are expected to be able to do so as well. The dependent variable is the number of words recalled from the 30 word list. So here we can see the factorial design with practice once and five times and stress level low and high. Now, in this design, we would need to have participants in each of the four cells of the design. Low stress and one practice 
low stress and five practices high stress and one practice and high stress and five practices here low stress one practice low stress five practices high stress one practice and high stress five practices let's say here that we have 25 participants in each of these four cells now, if the two factors in the study, which is practice and stress, interact, this means that the effect of one factor depends on the level of another factor, the other one. Let's insert some data to see if there is an interaction in the study. So these are the data that we input. This table indicates the cell means as well as the marginal means and the grand mean for the study. For example, the mean number of words we called under the low stress one practice condition is eight this one this is called the cell mean however the mean number of words recalled under all low stress conditions regardless of practice is 16 this is called the marginal mean so if the question is that do we have evidence of an interaction in the study well one way to answer this question is to begin by describing the mean effects. If we need to quantify or if we need to qualify our statements about the mean effects by saying it depends, then we have evidence that there may be an interaction. It appears that there may be main effect of stress. High stress conditions result in recall or fewer words than low stress conditions. It also appears that there is a main effect of practice. Five practices results in better recall of words than just one practice. However, the effect of the practice variable depends on the level of stress and vice versa. Under low stress conditions, practice seems to have a substantial positive effect. An average of, you can see right over here, eight words recalled with one practice, 24 words recalled with five practices but under high stress conditions practice has only a small effect that is four versus six words under the two practice conditions respectively we can all joke around and say that it's hard to learn stuff the day before our exams when our stress levels are usually very high therefore we have evidence of an interaction in this study so, of course, we will need to carry out the appropriate statistical test before we can conclude that this evidence is strong enough to support the claim that there is an interaction in the population. And we will want to know if there are other ways to detect this interaction besides examining the cell means. But this is actually the basic concept of how we can interpret interaction from factorial experiments. So, this was my third and final lecture on interaction. The first one were confounding and stratification. If you haven't checked them out, do give it a try. These are the references. I highly recommend this book, Epidemiology Study, Design and Anal Data Analysis by Chapman and Hall. Thank you, students. I hope you all learned something from all of my three lectures. I hope you're successful and best of luck for your future endeavors.